Well, good morning, Liberty Baptist Church. Aren't you glad to be in God's house today? Come on, get excited about this. I tell you what, I was glad, just like the psalmist said when they said, let us go into the house of the Lord. And it just got better and better this morning as I saw people that have been ill or been away for whatever various reasons coming back into God's house. And uh, I tell you, it, there's something special, folks. I hope you recognize that. There's something special when we gather together around the things of God, when we come together to worship. And I want to challenge you this morning not to take it for granted. There's a lot of churches that are closing today. Uh, they've closed their doors. Uh, there's In this country, there's demands being made upon churches that they can't open their doors. So this is a very, very important time in our history that we recognize what a privilege it is for us to gather together to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. And with, with, that, with that in mind, I want to ask you a couple of questions. I will, would like you just to give a verbal assent if you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Just say amen. amen. That's a good, that's good. Now I want you to do something else. I want you to take your, if you've got your Bibles with you today, I want you to take your Bibles and just raise them in the air. Not, going, not calling out anybody that doesn't have them, not even looking to see if you don't. But I see a lot of Bibles. That's fantastic. Let me share something with you. I've got to be very careful. Pastor hadn't given me the liberty to come up here and preach right now, but I was thinking this morning about worship and what really worship is. You just got through telling me that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, or I hope you were able to. And a good majority of you this morning rose, took your Bibles and you raised them in the air. Let me tell you what two things that that signifies. First of all, if you do know the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God dwelling within you. Okay? And another thing is, is that you know Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, he said himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. No, no, no man cometh unto the Father but by me, right? Well, in, in, excuse me, in John chapter 4, Jesus said these words in verse 23. But the hour cometh and now is when the true worshipers, true worshipers, shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship Him. Now think about that with me for just a minute. To worship in spirit and in truth. To have the Spirit of God is to be a child of God. Amen? So if you know Jesus Christ, you have the Spirit of God. So you've got one element of what it takes to worship. Secondly, we've gathered around, and I'm proud to say and glad to say and telling you that this is the only way I would come here anyway, but we've got a pastor that stands up and proclaims the, the truth of God's Word every time we come together. So those two ingredients have made it possible for us to come together and truly worship Jesus Christ this morning. Now, here's how that's going to happen. You're going to have to forget about yesterday. You're going to have to quit worrying about tomorrow. And you're going to have to focus on right now. Let's make this about the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, okay? I know there's some grieving going on out there. I know some of you have lost loved ones. Jesus knows that. I know some of you are still physically hurting. Some of you are going through some very difficult times in your health, finances, all sorts of things. But can we just stop and push all of that away this morning and make it about Jesus Christ? And let's, let's worship this morning, folks. Let's truly worship. As Jesus said, now is the time. The hour has come. We're not promised another Lord's Day. So let's take advantage of this one. Father God, we come to you. Would you stand with me, please? Father God, would, we come to you, and we thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege, the knowledge of the Word of God, Lord, that gives us an understanding of what it takes to, to be the child of God that you've called us to be, Father. You, you, you're not interested in just... Uh, casual Christianity Father you don't want us just going through the motions and we're so prone to it we're guilty of it would you forgive us for when we've done it Father but Lord this is a very special time this is a very special time today is a very special day Father we we can't undo yesterday we don't know if there is a tomorrow we're not promised to one we have right now so help us take full advantage of it. I pray this morning, Father, that you'd lead Brother Hill as he, as he leads the worship team, Father, just to take us through the throne of grace, Father, and truly lift up our voices, Lord, and sing unto the Lord in spirit and in truth. 
And then let that worship continue, Lord, as our pastor stands and proclaims the truth of your word, God. And, and Lord, may worship continue in every aspect of this day for us, Father, that it would catapult us into a, into a tomorrow should you give us one. We thank you, Lord, in advance for doing what we've asked. We thank you so much for all that you've done and for, for bringing so many folks back this morning, Father, and for the healing that you've shown you you're capable of. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's say. Day in history, dead is beaten. You have rescued me. Sing it out, Jesus is alive. Oh, come on, let's wake up. The empty cross, the empty grave. Life eternal, you have won the day. Shout it out, Jesus is alive. Oh, come on, church, he's alive. He's alive. And we sing it now. excited about serving a risen living Savior, I don't know what else you can get excited about. Maybe you're missing Brother Al's coffee this morning, but let's wake up and sing this one. I know he rescued my soul. His blood has covered my sin. I believe. I believe. My shame is taken away. So his blood is covered my 
morning. Amen. Some of you got the Baptist stiff going on this morning. It's okay to loosen up, be alive in God's house. Amen. That, that's something to shout about, that we serve a risen living Savior. Amen. All right, last Sunday of the month, your last chance to say together our memory verse, but definitely not your last chance to memorize it. If you haven't got it already, I taught you all this song actually the last Sunday of last month. This is a, a scripture song. To help you learn, Galatians 2.20, it goes like this. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20. Somebody say amen. I encourage you, learn. There's a lot of scripture songs out there. If we ever have a memory verse and you wonder if there's one, I'll look and see. If not, make up your own tune. Sing it to something uh, you already know. Sing it to another song, but learn God's word. Hide God's word in your heart. We can't stress the importance of learning and memorizing God's word. Amen. If you're glad to be at Liberty Baptist Church, turn to the person next to you and say, I'm glad to see you this morning. And I'm glad to see you as well. Let's continue in worship this morning. i 
I count on one thing The same God who never fails Will not fail me now You won't fail me now In the waiting The same God who's never late Is working all things out You're working all things out Oh yes I first song that we sang, Great Are You, Lord. Some of you know that uh, our family has gone through a, a tragedy this week. I plan these songs weeks ahead. What God lays on my heart for each Sunday is it's already planned weeks and weeks ahead. How fitting that he had that song playing. When a loved one passes unexpectedly, it's, it's easy to fall into the valley real quick. One thing that stood out to me in that Hope for Hurting Hearts that we watched a few weeks ago was when Jeremy Camp's wife died, the minute she breathed her last breath in that hospital room, Jeremy said that he felt Jesus whisper to him, worship me. Not a request, but a demand. Worship me. Folks, when you're going through some dark stuff in your life, it's not the time to sit back and have a pity party. That's when we worship him. 
times when we fall on our face and we confess that we can't do this on our own. And sometimes all we can say is, great are you, Lord. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out our praise, pour your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise we pour out our praise it's your breath in our lungs so we pour out our praise to you only Jesus I'm so thankful for the peace that can only be found in you I thank you that I can praise you in the middle of the storm just as well as I can praise you on the mountaintop. The God that never changes doesn't deserve any less worship whether I'm on the mountain or in the valley. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for laying that song on my heart a couple weeks ago. Knowing that today would be a day that I needed that. Lord, I worship you and I lift you high because you alone are worthy of my praise. And no matter what happens, you're a good, good father. Thank you, Lord, for meeting with us in this place today. We feel your presence. God, we pray that these songs have softened and prepared our hearts for the message, the most important part of the service. That God, as pastor comes and preaches what you've laid on his heart, Lord, I pray that lives will be changed by the power of the word. It's in the precious name of Jesus we pray all these things. Amen. You may be seated. Well, amen. Thank you, Brother Hill. Our hearts go out to you and your family, especially Miss Liz and her dad and sisters uh, at the passing of her mom this week. Uh, let's continue to pray uh, for them as we go through our day today and through this week. It is so good to see you in God's house. I, I was as giddy as a little kid on Christmas morning uh, knowing that some of our folks that have been out were going to be here today. Uh, Just getting to see them again. It's been some time with the COVID. Uh, Many have been in the hospital, and uh, they've been care-flighted, and they've been all over the place. A lot of things going on. 
And uh, they're back today, and to God be the glory for that, amen, for healing. And I appreciate the church uh, uh, faithfully praying uh, for so many uh, that have been going through difficulties. And I was telling Brother uh, Ken this morning, you know, uh, I know there's been a lot of hype and stuff about the COVID, and, but I, I told you a few weeks ago, I underestimated it, and when I got it, it, it was some rough stuff. And I got to tell you, I'm still getting over it. I still have some little things that show up. Uh, day to day and so uh, be safe uh, wash your hands do all the things that you need to do and and uh, and Lord willing we'll get through this and get on the other side of it very soon amen the other thing is good to see brother Miss Dishman and boy brother Roger you look so awesome holding that little baby girl over there three strapping boys and God blessed them with the little girl and so uh, at the end of the service uh, I'll have y'all come up and uh, we'll pray over her, and, and you can uh, uh, tell us her name and her weight and all of the, all the particulars. i got to be honest with you, uh, we got a lot of ground to cover this morning in the Bible and in the preaching, and I'm going to tell you up front, uh, for some, this could be controversial, some of the things that I'm going to say, but you know me, I'm a truth teller, and what I believe by faith and what I see I pray over and what God lays on my heart, and I pray diligently over this. Uh, but I want you this morning to be in Revelation chapter 4 with me. Now, i got to tell you again another thing. I've got a gazillion verses to give you this morning because there's nothing better than the Bible. It's not my words. It's not my wisdom, not my anecdotes, not, uh, not the things that I can, I can come up with that make, you know, alliterate or make it sound neat and flow neat. It's the Word of God that changes lives. Amen? But I want to tell you this morning, as I look around uh, the world today, every single day, I'm increasingly more convinced that we're living on the edge of eternity. We're living on the edge of eternity. This morning, I sat at the Sonic drive-in waiting on my diet, Dr. Pepper, and I took notice of the beautiful morning. It was beautiful, right? And, I, you know, I just it feels good. The sun's up, the skies are clear, the birds are flying and singing, and uh, it dawned on me, though, that the streets were dead. Now, I drive those streets every morning in, a, in my truck, in a school bus, and uh, it, it's crazy on Southwest Parkway. There's cars everywhere. But this morning, Sunday, a day of worship, Resurrection Sunday, God's Day, there was like three cars total on Southwest Parkway, Fairway, uh, until I got to Cal. There were a few more there. And it dawned on me as I, as I considered that, and, and I considered the fact that this is the day that God has set apart for us to worship Him, the one true living God of the universe. You know what? I remembered how the spirit of, of Antichrist has gone out into the world. Why are people at home? Why are people off the streets on the day, if there was ever a day to be out? It's today. It's the day of worship. Tomorrow will be crazy, but today everybody was home. And I remember the spirit of Antichrist has gone out in this, into this world in the last days and has entered the hearts and minds of the earth's inhabitants and people would rather worship other gods or self than the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's really what it is. Another god, a false god, is anything that comes between you and Almighty God. It, it keeps you from worshiping as Brother Hill so eloquently said, quoting Jeremy Camp, as God told him in the loss of his wife, worship me. You see, when, it, when we hurt, when we, when we don't know what to do, that's what we are to do. We're to come to the throne of grace and we're to worship Almighty God. Folks, the days in which we are living are literally screaming to the world that it's drawing to a close. Now listen, I want to tell you up front, I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I want to give you some warnings this morning about some things that are going on in our world and what I believe is going to happen very, very soon. We can't go on like we're going. Amen? And I realize that Americans tend to measure their thinking uh, on the end times by what they see going on in America. But I'm going to tell you, America is not the center of the world in God's economy. In fact, every other map in the world, except maps out of America, every other map in the world, Jerusalem is the center of it. The Middle East is the center of it. 
We're way out here to the west. And so it's, it's, it's a form of indoctrination that, that tells us from the time we're little, bit, little bitty children that the world centers around America, but it doesn't. But we tend to judge the things that we believe about God and, and His Word and the return of the Lord Jesus Christ by what we see going on in America. But what we got to remember is in 1948, the Jews returned to their land and, and, and the only time in history they became a nation for the second time. And when that happened, God's clock would begin to move again in terms of the Lord Jesus Christ returning and the end of the world. So we need to be watching closely to the nation of Israel. There's things going on right now that we need to be aware of. And you might not be able to discern all the times. I can't discern all the things that are going on. But there's a movement right now in Israel and in the rest of the world. The the pieces are being moved around and put into place for the end of the world. And America's connection with all this has simply been this. We have blessed Israel, and because we've blessed Israel, God has blessed us. But that, my friends, is about to change. Do you understand that? That's about to change. I mean, we're already back in... We literally... Uh, if you, and you can go Google this. We literally de- delivered cargo planes of cash. Car, think about that. Cargo planes of cash to Iran under the Obama administration. Well, President Trump came in, and he's not perfect. I don't agree with him on everything, but he ended that business. You don't pay somebody trying to get nuclear weapons for the purpose of destroying Israel. You don't pay them money to go build the things. And yet that's exactly what's happened. And they continue to enrich uranium. Nuclear weapons are bad. Do you understand what I'm saying? They're bad. They'll never be used especially in these third world countries, never be used for anything but to terrorize and destroy God's people. And whatever it takes to get that done, they're willing to do it. So God has blessed us because we blessed Israel. And that's what the Bible says. I'll bless them that bless thee, and I'll curse them that curse thee. But folks, this is changing. The world around us is in complete upheaval. And you might have gotten to the point where, and we understand that all the media, the social media and all that, it's all garbage, okay? They're they're censoring, First Amendment rights are gone. They're censoring, they're canceling people. I mean, for crying out loud, they've canceled the My Pillow dude simply because he supported the president. We got to see him at Prestonwood Baptist Church at the men's conference. I'm going to tell you, that dude's got an awesome testimony. He was a drug addict. He was a loser, and yet the Lord Jesus Christ saved him, and he started making pillows in his living room. And today he's a multimillionaire because God blesses those that bless Israel, and God blesses those that follow His commands and His word. And so uh, Mike, the, the my pillow guy, has been blessed, but the world don't like that. And, and let alone the fact that, I mean, it's amazing to think that a former drug dealer that uh, had done jail time started making pillows out of his living room for the Lord Jesus Christ and His glory, and he gives away millions and millions of dollars to the poor. Millions and millions of dollars he gives away to churches. But he's been canceled simply because of his support for a president and his policies. Last night I I got to sit with uh, two German nationals at my sister-in-law's birthday party. She's a part of the Junior League, and they are the liaisons to the German Air Force and also the German school out at uh, Notre Dame. And uh, uh, it was interesting because one's a German pilot, the other is working on his doctorate in London School of Economics and Political Science. This dude is smart, okay? But I got to sit right by him and uh, and, and eat a meal, and and, and they started talking to me about the world. And again, uh, and this is what they said, they said, you know, Americans judge the world by what is America is, but that's not the world. I mean, this guy's literally living and studying in London right now, and he's from Germany. And he said this, he said, the world is in chaos. In fact, he was supposed to go back after Christmas to London, but he's here till February because of what was going on over there. He said, their rights have been, de- have been destroyed over there. And he said what really scared him was the fact that people have just resigned to it. 
Rather than stand up and rather than fight it, people have just resigned to it. And it's like whatever will be, will be. They've been beat down. They've been, their identity has been robbed of them from their mask and all the different things. And, 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 and these guys, these are not Christians, by the way. And they see what's going on in the world. And they say Americans have no clue about the rest of the world and how bad it is. America, as bad as we think it is, they said while America is going through some difficulties, it doesn't even come close to what the rest of the world is dealing with right now. America, I want to tell you, and I told you I was going to be controversial this morning, under the leadership of Joe Biden is literally running away that all that we have been and all that we have sought to be as a nation for 245 years. Joe Biden has literally destroyed America in less than two weeks with all of his stinking executive orders. We have a capital that has always been the beacon of hope and freedom to the world. Amen? And now our capital has fences. I thought those people didn't like fences, but we got fences everywhere and Constantina wire on top of them and National Guardsmen standing, standing guard over D.C. for what? I would give you example after example this morning of how America is no longer one nation under God, but I will, I've got one that I want to give you, I want to show you this morning by way of video. So if you would tune into the screens, uh, check this out. Many of you have probably seen this. Uh, it's, it's insane when you realize what it is. Pay very close attention here. Eternal God, noiselessly, we bow before your throne of grace as we leave behind the politically and socially clamorous year of 2020. We gather now in this consequential chamber to inaugurate another chapter in our roller coaster representative government. The members of this august body acknowledge your sacred supremacy and therefore confess that without your favor and forbearance, we enter this new year relying dangerously on our own fallible nature. God, at a moment when many believe that the bright light of democracy is beginning to dim, empower us with an extra dose of commitment to its principles. May we of the 117th Congress refuel the lamp of liberty so brimful that generations unborn will witness its undying flame. And may we model community healing, control our tribal tendencies, and quicken our spirit that we may feel thy priestly presence even in moments of heightened disagreement. May we so feel your presence that our service here may not be soiled by any utterances or acts unworthy of this high office. Insert in our spirit a light so bright that we can see ourselves in our politics as we really are, soiled by selfishness, perverted by prejudice, and inveigled by ideology. Now may the God who created the world and everything in it bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of his countenance upon us and give us peace. Peace in our families, peace across this land. And dare I ask, O oh Lord, peace even in this chamber, now and evermore. We ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths. Amen. And a woman. <laughs> All right, that's good. Uh, so much of what he said sounded, with little bitty bleeps of certain words, sounded good. First of all, he's talking about democracy, and I won't even get into that aspect of it because everything he stands for and everything he supports is destroying our democracy. 
He talks about a democracy being a beacon of light in the world. Well, that light is dying, okay, because of people like this guy. Not only that, but not only is he wrong on uh, his position as a representative in the Congress, but he's wrong and a total idiot, I will say, as a, quote, so-called man of God. John Wesley, who founded the Methodist Church, is rolling and spinning in his grave if he heard that right there. And let me tell you why. One of the things about Emmanuel uh, Carter here in his opening prayer is he asked when he prayed in the name Braham, uh, peace across the land and inside Congress as well. When he prayed in that name, do you know who he was praying to? Now we, we say in God we trust and people throw that name God around. And as Americans and as Christians, we understand that we are talking about Jehovah, Elohim. Yeshua, Jesus Christ, we know who we're talking about, the great I Am. The guy that he named is the Hindu God. You know, you've seen the statues, that Hindu guy with all the arms? Yeah, that's who he's talking about. That's who that is right there. The God who created the world and everything in it, bless us and keep us uh, uh, may the Lord make His face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. May the Lord lift up the light of the countenance upon us and give us peace in our families, peace across the land. And dare I ask, O oh Lord, peace even in this chamber. Now and evermore we ask in the name of the monotheistic God. Well, first of all, that's a sign he's an idiot because the Hindu gods are not monotheistic. They're polytheistic. There's not one God. There's many gods. You know, whatever you want to be a God, as long as you're sincere, can be your God is what they teach. So to use the word mono means one, mono mono means one on one. Monotheistic God, Braham, is a God, he says, is known to many different faiths. The creator God in Hinduism. Now let me tell you about this God. According to legend, Braham was self-born inside of a golden egg. Although he is considered to be the God of creation, Bahram is also considered to be a mortal. Mortal. But just in case worshiping a Hindu idol wasn't controversial enough, he then concludes the prayer with a man and a woman. What the heck? Excuse me, but what the heck? Amen is a transliteration of the Hebrew word emma, and the verb occurs more than 100 times in the Old Testament. And what it means is that which is faithful and true. And it says, I agree. So might it be. So might it be. God bless us. Amen. So might it be. Are you saved? Absolutely. Amen. A woman? What the heck? Jesus talked about this word, amen, and it's ligo humane, and that is when he would say it, it means truly I say unto you. So when he said amen, whatever he said previous to that or prior to that, he, he was saying, this is what I'm saying to you. Listen to me. Listen to me. It's kind of like when he says verily, verily. He's talking about the magnitude of what he's saying. And so what are we to do, folks? What are we to do, church, in a time when good is evil and evil is good? And that's, that's what we have to call that. The Congress? We're no longer a one nation under God. When we say God, the one true living God, Jehovah God, we're no longer under that. We just got prayed over by a, a Methodist that don't have enough theology to fill a thimble that is praying to a Hindu God. I want you to listen to what Paul told Timothy in first, and I'm going to give you these verses. You can write them down, but I'm going to read quickly. In 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 17, it says, This know also in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure, more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away, for of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away of different lust and, and ever learning, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. 
Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Reprobate concerning the faith. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. But thou hast fully known my doctrine, what we believe, and what we believe about God. Amen? That's doctrine. Theology is the study of God. Amen? Theo being God. Thou hast fully known my doctrine, my manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came to me at Antioch and Iconium and Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. But ev- Now listen to this, church. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in all things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. Then he says, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God might be perfect, that means complete, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Evil is going to get worse and worse before the Lord Jesus returns. That flies in the face of what everybody says. We're all getting better, just a little bit better every day. No, we're getting worse. The heart is desperately wicked, and who can know it? And and one of the things that I'm concerned about is that the Spirit of God, which certainly lives in our hearts as believers to those that are saved, the Spirit of God has removed His influence in Washington, removed His power in Washington. And folks, what must we do? We must prepare our hearts. We must prepare our minds. And we must prepare our families for what is coming. Luke 13, 33 says, Take heed, watch, and pray, for ye know not when the time is. Things are going to get rough, my friends. I have people coming to me at work every day, pulling up their cars as I'm leaving, and they want to talk. They they ask questions. They want to know. I talked to a guy the other day uh, for 45 minutes after work, talking about these things. What do you think? They, people are scared. They see what's going on. What do we do? Well, we understand. We, we prepare our minds. We take heed. We watch. We pray. And as a pastor, I must prepare you. And that's what I'm doing this morning. And you must prepare yourselves. Romans 3.10 says this, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation. That's what we need to be kept by Almighty God from the hour of temptation. What is that? When we, when we say, you know what? I'm going to go along to get along. Like those Germans are fearful that people have just resigned themselves to the quote, new normal. They give up that which was sacred to them, that which was holy to them. And many, we understand in the last days there's going to be a falling away. Many people that were um, once quote Christ followers or Christians are going to fall away and they're just going to turn their backs on God. We understand that from the Scriptures. That's going to happen. But folks, we're seeing it happen today. But, but uh, uh, John writes here, because thou hast uh, kept the word of my patience, it's Jesus talking, but John's writing, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Folks, tribulation is coming. That's hard to take. And I've got to be honest with you, I don't like it. I don't like the fact that I'm reading things are going to get rough. Hey, I'm, the, I'm a normal Joe. I want to, I want to uh, get up every morning and just have a great day and everything be positive and wonderful and uh, spend time with my kids and spend time with my wife and, 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 and spend time with my friends and, and just enjoy the, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ, seeing souls saved and life shines. I, I, I love for things just to be great, but we're, we're heading into a time now. I believe it's turned where things are going to get rough. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 24, 29, 31. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn for they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory and he shall send his angels with the sound of the trumpet and, and shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Now that we're, we start talking about the day of the Lord here and what's coming. The day of the Lord is not just a single day but a period of time that's going to happen. 
And, 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 and again, I want you to go to your text now in Revelation chapter 4, and I want to show you something here. Again, John writing of his experience on the Isle of Patmos as he was there writing the revelation of Jesus Christ. Not the revelation of John, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is what Jesus gave him. And he says in verse 1, And after this, I looked, and behold, a door was open in heaven. If I were in the habit of marking my Bible, I would underscore after this. Because that's referring to all the things that were uh, written in the first three chapters, okay? He said, A door was open in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was as it were a trumpet talking with, uh, with me, which said, Come up hither. And I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, John says, I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one set on the throne. So what are we to do in perilous times when good is evil and evil is good? Verse 1 says, after this, understand that there's an event coming in the near future that will be the end of, for all of those that have, have denied God, denied the Lord Jesus Christ, it will be the end of all of this for those who have followed the Lord Jesus Christ and understand we will be, just like John said, a throne in heaven. We will be ushered into the presence of Almighty God in heaven by the Lord Jesus Christ. The words after this, of course, in verse 1, indicate that the me- it's a message about the church. The first three chapters of, of this revelation is about the church. But I want to tell you, beginning in, 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 verse, or in chapter 4, in verse 1 and 2, after that, the, the church is never mentioned again. So what do we see right here? This, of course, as he says, I was immediately in the Spirit, this is emblematical of the fact uh, of John being representative of the church, being snatched away, raptured out of here. What's the next event that you and I are looking for? That, uh, and it's the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not in the clouds, not visibly that the world sees him, but as a thief in the night. He comes and he takes his bride in the night and no one, no one uh, will know what's happened. The rapture is not found in the English Bible, that word, but in earlier Latin translations it was. And in the Latin word is rapier and it means to be caught up or snatched away. And there's many theories on when this could take place, but the truth of the matter is it could take place right now, today. There's been so many moments in time in recent weeks where I really felt, man, it it became so clearly uh, evident to me that, you know what, this could be that moment. And I began to immediately think, what would that be like? I'm here, I'm I'm on earth, I'm doing my things. And then to be immediately caught up and never go back to that job, never go back to that home, never go back to that car. Hey, never come back to this church. What would that be like? But that's what the rapture is going to be. He's going to snatch us out of here in the moment and time when we least expect it. So what do we got to do? We've we've got to be prepared. And I want to talk about this event this morning that we need to be prepared about. So uh, I want to take you to Matthew 24 and and talk about it because Matthew gives some indicators uh, that would be in the world when the Lord Jesus comes and raptures His bride up and out to be with Him. So in Matthew 24, verse 37, uh, when are these things going to come to pass, Jesus? He says in verse 37, But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And of course the Bible says that there was wickedness all over the world, that people hated one another and it had just gotten absolutely crazy. And he says they were marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark. And they knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Then shall two be in the field and the one shall be taken and the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill. One shall be taken, the other one left. Watch therefore, watch therefore, for you don't know the hour when the Lord is coming. Anytime I I think about the rapture and that event, my mind immediately goes back to the 1970s. There was a movie called A Thief in the Night. I found it on YouTube the other day. It just happened to pop up for some reason on my uh, my feed. And and so I I, I watched it. And I remember just being scared to death 
uh, in the 70s of that movie. And it, the acting was terrible, the music wasn't great, the cinematography was not that great, but man, the message was powerful. You know, the, the ladies uh, going in there to talk to her husband, hey, Bob, hey, John, whatever his name was, and, and she comes in the bathroom, his razor's laying there, but he's gone. And she walks outside to look around, and there's a lawnmower, but the man's gone. And the clothes are there, and I mean, they're, they're missing. And I thought about that, and then uh, that, I thought about the song that Larry Norman, he was one of the original Jesus freaks. He was oftentimes ostracized and rejected by mainline uh, Christianity because he had hair down to the middle of his back and a big old beard, but he loved Jesus. And he started the Jesus movement out in California, and he wrote a song, and the, the haunting chorus of that song was, The sun has come, and you've been left behind. And they, they, they played that song in the movie. And the song sums up the tragic and ever-frightening reality that many are going to face the day after the rapture. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. Folks, I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of theories about the rapture. There's a lot of, of, of theories that people have. But instead of, of folks and all that, I want to tell you there's a fact that we need to understand this morning. And it's a fact that Satan himself has deceived many people about. It's a fact that Satan would like for you to forget this morning. And that's the fact that the Lord Jesus, the only begotten Son of God, who left heaven on an errand of mercy, lived a, was born of a virgin, lived a sinless life, and then laid down his life on an old rugged cross for your sin and for my sin, was buried in a grave. The Lord Jesus Christ, who ascended through the clouds uh, before the, uh, the eyes of the disciples, that looked on. The Lord Jesus that ascended through those clouds and the angel said, guess what? He's coming back. The Lord Jesus that is even now seated at the right hand of the throne of God ever make an intercession for us. The devil comes and says, let me tell you about Rick Ross and Jesus, my advocate, stands up and says, Father, it's under the blood. The, the Lord Jesus, who's King of kings and Lord of lords, this same Jesus is coming back very soon for you and for me. Amen? We have His Word on it. Remember John chapter 14. John chapter 14, the disciples are, 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 are discouraged. Jesus is going away. And He says, let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. By the way, because I am God. He says, don't be troubled. He says, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And he said, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, there ye may be also. Amen? I'm going to prepare. When Jesus ascended into heaven, He left for heaven to prepare a place for me and for you and all those that have been born again, not of, of corruptible seed, but of the Spirit of Almighty God. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, uh, we see the, the, the wonderful uh, taking up of Jesus Christ manifested there. And, in, and I love the passage. It says, and while they steadfastly, or where they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood before him. These were angels of God. And he said, you men of Galilee, why stand you gazing up into heaven? Why are you standing, gazing up into heaven? Maybe teary-eyed. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you, He's going to come in like manner. He's coming back. I've told you before, the Old Testament is, is the message over and over from Genesis to Malachi. Jesus is coming. The Messiah is coming. The Christ is coming. The Christ is coming. 400 years of silence. Matthew opens up. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the synoptic gospels tell us, guess what? Jesus is here. The Messiah is here. The Christ is here. He's been born. He's lived. He's died. He's here. And then He goes up. He ascends into heaven. And the rest of the Bible from, from uh, John all the way to Revelation says what? He's coming back. This same Jesus is coming back. It could be today, it could be tomorrow. Jesus said, no man knows the hour of the day. Only my Father, Jesus said, I don't even know. Only my Father which is in heaven. But you just mark it down, my friend, Jesus is coming and it's very soon. And we're closer today than it ever could, ever could have possibly have been or be. And when He comes, it's going to be the most awesome thing any human being has ever experienced. I was watching a video the other day of, I, I follow UFC and MMA fighters. I love that. I did karate many, many years ago for quite a while. And 
I couldn't, I couldn't fight my way out of a wet paper bag right now. I get, I get tapped out by my covers in the bed sometimes, you know, if I get tangled up pretty good. But I love watching the MMA. I love watching the art of, of martial arts and really the, the art of war uh, uh, and all the techniques and all the, all the artistry that goes into that. But I was watching this one MMA fighter that I follow, and he got to ride in a F-22, the stealth, the baddest fighter that America has. It's got vectoring, which allows it literally to, you know, to just cut like that. It can go up and just literally stop and float in the air. I mean, it's amazing. And what was cool was, and think, can think about the G-force that is on them in that. But this pilot took him up, and he was in the back seat, and at the end of the runway, it just stood straight up went to 15,000 feet, and he was like, ah, you know, this is an MMA fighter. This is a bad dude, one of the baddest in the UFC. And he was like, ah, it scared, the, scared him to death. Can I tell you, that doesn't even come close to what's going to happen that day, that we are snatched away before our, an eye can blink. We're here and then we're gone. We're here and then we're gone. I want to give you four things quickly this morning about this event we call the rapture. First of all, we know that when Jesus comes, He's going to come suddenly. That word means quickly, quickly. In other words, when, when it begins, it's going to be like a lightning flash. You see it, and it's gone. A lot of times people have the idea, well, you know, I'm not so sure about all this stuff, but one of these days when I hear the trumpet, then, you know, I'll make a decision on that day. There will be no time. He's coming suddenly. Listen to what 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51 through 57 says. This event that's going to literally snatch your breath away. Paul writes to the church of Corinth, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means Christians, speaking of Christians. We shall not all die. But we shall be changed in the moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trump shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. We're getting rid of these mortal, frail, broken bodies. Amen? The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the same that is, that is written, Death is swallowed in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The victory belongs to Jesus, amen. The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is His law. But Paul writes, but thanks be to God which giveth the victory, how? Through our Lord Jesus Christ, amen. So Jesus is going to come, and it's going to be suddenly in the blink of an eye. I, I, I can't even imagine what that's like. I mean, we blink hundreds of thousands of times every day, and we don't even realize it. We don't even realize it. You try to do a staring contest and you're like doing, doing this right here and then you finally give away, and, but then you just barely even notice that you blinked. But think about this, like a, a surprise blast of a trumpet, a sudden gust of wind. Jesus is coming, suddenly. Listen, one second we're here and the next second we're gone and we're with Jesus. We are here and in one, one second, and the next second, we are gone. We are changed. Our corruptible bodies have been made. The Bible says, it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know this, that we shall be like Jesus, for we shall see Him as He is. A lot of people, they try to split theological and doctrinal hairs. How far was it from Jerusalem to Jericho? Who cares? What's going to be? I don't know, but I know my body is going to be like Jesus, and I'm going to be with Jesus. So I'm okay with that. Amen? 1 Thessalonians 5, 3. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Miss Dishman just had a little baby girl. And I, there's been so many different examples, but uh, maybe that day. Uh, y'all induced, though, didn't you? Did y'all induce? Kind of. Pitocin's terrible, isn't it? But uh, anyway, you know, a lot of people uh, get up, she, they're expecting, they've, they've been waiting for the moment, but, but they really don't know. And if they're not induced or doing cesarean or something like that, they're walking around enjoying their day and all of a sudden, ooh. I'm a really good illustration of a pregnant woman, by the way, you know. <laughs> don't make fun. Don't judge. But no, really, they're doing their day. And all of a sudden, oh. As travail upon a woman. And then next, next thing you know, 
<laughs> there's a baby. There's a life that's here. Matthew wrote in Matthew 24, 27, Whereas lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. That's what it's like. He's coming suddenly. Revelation 22, 20, He which testifies these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. And notice he didn't say a woman, bless God. Amen, even so come Lord Jesus. You know what probably the most common prayer I pray every, every day just about is now? Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Come quickly. I love the life that God's blessed me with. I love to think about the possibility of, of my sons finding a bride and, and being a grandparent one day, but you know what? I will give all of that up in a, without even thinking twice about it to be with Jesus. What if he came in the next second? What if he came before you could think? Mark 13, 34 says, For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. He said, y'all do your chores, y'all take care of things, and the porter, you watch for the fact I'm coming back. Watch ye therefore, for ye know not what hour your master of the house cometh. And he's pointing this for a, to uh, this out, Jesus is in this story, for a very specific reason. Why watch? Why do your jobs? Because you don't know when I'm coming back. And, and, and when I come back, I expect things to be done, have been done decently and in order. I expected you to stay on task. I'm the master. You work for me. You serve me. And when I come back, I, I expect things to be where they're supposed to be. And Jesus says that to Christians today. I'm coming back. But so many are asleep. Watch ye therefore, you know, know what are your master of the house cometh. At evening or at midnight or at the cock crowing or in the morning? Lest coming suddenly he finds you sleeping. How tragic would that be for Jesus to come back? This master comes back and those servants are supposed to be working. Well, midday they're taking a siesta. Again, Matthew 24, 40 says, Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken, the other left. Two women shall be grinding at the mill, one shall be taken, the other one left. Watch ye therefore, you know not what hour your Lord doth come. So he's coming suddenly. But notice the second thing, he's coming surprisingly. He will come surprisingly. When Lord Jesus comes, he's going to catch the world by surprise. By surprise. Listen to what Matthew 24, 36 says. Uh, says but, but of that day and hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. So what were they doing? As in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. They're going about life as usual. Until the day that Noah entered the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them all away, so also shall the coming of the Son of Man be. It's just going to be a, 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 a regular day. People are going to be driving their cars. People are going to be at work. People are going to be sitting down for a meal. And maybe people will be even in a church service like this. And all of a sudden, suddenly, and surprisingly, the trumpet sounds, the Lord Jesus comes, and the children of God are taken out. I think it'd be great to have it on a Sunday morning. People will disappear, leaving their clothes and jewelry behind. That's one of the things interesting about the old movies back in the 70s. When people left their clothes and everything, it was perfectly folded in a nice, uh, neat stack, which was, was kind of funny. It's not going to happen that way. This mortal body is going to leave. It's going to be transformed, changed in the moment and twinkling of an eye. And anything attached to us, on us, is staying here and we're gone. Swings will dangle empty as children go to be with Jesus. Amen. Driverless vehicles will careen out of control. Airplanes whose pilots knew the Lord Jesus will, will be gone and the planes will be left to fall out of the sky. The world is going to go into utter chaos in that time. And this is what's going to make it so easy for Antichrist to step up and go, folks, I got it. It's okay. Here's what we need to do. And just as there's resignation in Germany and Europe right now, and even in America, there's resignation to go, okay, I don't know. I'm frantic. I'm panicked. I'll, I'll follow you. And that's what the world is going to do for Antichrist. He's going to say, here's the plan, and it'll work. It'll work. 
And people will mindlessly follow him. Jesus said it would be that way. He's, that's why he said in Matthew 24, 42 through 44, Watch therefore, watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what watch the thief would come, he would have watched and would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man comes. Go to work tomorrow. Ask your friends there. Whether they believe in Jesus or not, you can ask them. Do you think that Jesus Christ is, is coming, coming back really soon? And see what they say. Most people are going to look at you like you're total nuts. What? Yeah, I've heard of that guy, but coming back for what? They have no clue. They're running to and fro, doing life, and they have no clue that any moment the Lord Jesus Christ could come. They're not watching, they're not ready, but like a thief in the night, when you least expect it, Jesus comes and they'll be left behind. What a dreadful shock to many when they find where they're at. What a terrible surprise. Matthew 25, 1 says, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Folks, are you ready this morning? Are you watching? Are you waiting? Or are you going to be in for the shock of your life? 1 Thessalonians 5, 4 says, But ye brethren, ye brethren, he's talking to Christians, you're not in darkness. Amen for that, right? That the day should overtake you as a thief. So Jesus is coming surprisingly. And many will be left behind. So he's coming suddenly and surprisingly. But notice the third thing, he's also coming specifically. Jesus Christ, in, 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 in the truth, my friends, and let this sink in, Jesus Christ is not coming for everybody. All dogs don't go to heaven, so to speak. I remember Oprah, there's a, a Christian on there talking about this subject, and Oprah goes, well, there can't just be one way. There can't be. There's got to be many different ways and roads. And the point she was making is, basically, in my line of thinking, people should be able to do whatever they want and still get into heaven. But folks, that's, that wouldn't be right, would it? If I said, church, here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going to meet up tonight. And uh, I'm going to give you something today. We're going to meet up tonight. And if you can bring that back filled out, ready to go, I'm taking everybody to eat steak this evening. But then there's some people that, that show up that didn't even bother to do it. They show up and go, man, I'm ready for that steak dinner, Pastor. But they, they didn't do the task. They weren't ready. Would it be fair if I said, you know what, that's all right. Come on in. No, we've laid out a clear plan of who gets to go. Matthew 24, 40 through 1, Then shall two be in the field, one shall be taken the other left. Not everybody's going. The Lord Jesus Christ is coming specifically, listen, for those who have accepted by faith the Lord Jesus Christ and not only made Him Savior, but Lord of their life. Some people want a, want a hell insurance policy. Yeah, Jesus, rub a little Jesus on it, but they don't want anything else from Jesus. I'm going to heaven, I'm not going to hell, that's pretty much it. But folks, I honestly, in my heart, I don't think it works that way. I believe Jesus is either Lord of all or He's not Lord at all. And I believe those that are falling away right now and walking away and won't come to serve the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe they're lost. I love them. But it breaks my heart, but I believe the problem in their life is not that they've got legitimate reasons or excuses for not serving Jesus. I don't believe that they know Jesus. Now let's look at Matthew 25, verse 1. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and, and went forth to meet the bridegroom. This is something that happened in ancient times. Five of them were wise and five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and, and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. While the bridegroom tarried, that means while he wasn't coming, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight there was a cry made, Behold, the trumpet, the bridegroom cometh. It's time to go out and meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish virgin said unto the wise, Hey, give us some of your oil, for the lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, No, 
What? No. So lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. So the, so the trumpet has sounded. The bridegroom is coming. The bridegroom is coming. Y'all, y'all get to the corner store quickly and buy some oil, he says. Verse 10. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were, were ready went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. What that means is when the door was shut, it's just like in Noah's Ark. He preached for 120 years, judgment's coming, rain's coming. Hey, what are you building, Noah? A boat. What's a boat? Well, it's what floats on the the water. What? what? Why are you doing that? 120 years, Noah? Because judgment's coming. God's going to flood the whole world. (laughs) You're crazy, dude. And they knew not until the day that God shut the door. Why did God shut the door? Because I think Noah and his sons would have probably, hey, come on in. It's the, oh, look, it's, it's, it's the, this family that we, li- we, know, we know we're friends with. Hey, come on in. But the Bible says God shut the door. Just like he did here. And the door was shut. And that speaks of, of an eternal closing of the door. To those folks. In this parable, we see the bridegroom's not coming for everybody. He's only coming those, for those who are watching and waiting. Paul wrote to Timothy and said in 2 Timothy 4, 7 through 8, I fought a good fight. I finished the course. I've kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only, I love this part because that, this gives me hope, not to me only, but unto all them that also love His appearing. Who are these people for whom the Lord is coming? I'll tell you what, He's not coming for good people. He's not coming for religious people. He's not coming for the baptized. He's not coming for the confirmed. He's not even coming for the church member. No, He is coming specifically for the blood-bought, born-again band that knows the Lord Jesus Christ and by faith and trust they have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the death, burial, and the resurrection. And not only were they, is He Savior to them, but He's also Lord. He calls the shots in their life. And He's coming specifically for them. He's going to check the book. The Bible calls it the book of life. To see if the names are written there. And He's only coming for those who have put their faith and trust in His finished work. So the question is, are you saved this morning? If you're not saved... You can't go back to that moment in time when you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't go back to that crisis of belief when confronted with the fact of your lostness and the Lord Jesus Christ finished work to pay for your lostness, to pay for your sins. If you can't go back to that moment in time when you realize, I'm a sinner, I'm lost, I'm dying and going to hell. But I accept Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin today by faith. You can't go back to that time, my friend. You're lost And you're not ready. You're not ready for when Jesus comes. If Jesus came right now, do you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, beyond a shadow of a doubt that you would go with Him or would you be left behind? Someone says, well, Pastor Ross, uh, I'm 99.9% sure that I am saved and I'll go. I've said it before, to be 99% sure is to be 100% lost, my friends. The Bible says, These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. I know that I'm saved. I know that when Jesus comes. Am I perfect? No. Do I mess up? Yes. Does it break my heart? Yes. Does it break God's heart? Absolutely. That's why He says if you confess your sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's not a one-time event. That for me sometimes is daily it seems like. But praise God... The sin is under the blood. So he's coming suddenly like lightning, surprisingly like a thief and specifically for those who are ready. Notice lastly this morning, Jesus will come finally. When Jesus comes for the saved, it'll be a one-time deal. Understand what I'm saying? There will be no second chances for those that have rejected Jesus. I want you to turn your Bibles to this passage, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, because a lot of people ask me this question. Because a lot of people think, well, I'm here this morning and... And and I'm hearing the gospel, but I haven't made a decision yet. Listen, not to make a decision for Christ is by default to make a decision to reject Christ. Do you understand that this morning? The gospel's been given. And a lot of people think, well, you know what? When the trumpet sounds and I realize there's going to be a lot of Christians gone, but uh, 
I'll get it. I'll look around and go, you know, I remember the Bible said uh, this, and I remember that crazy preacher down at Liberty Baptist Church preaching about this. I thought he was nuts, but apparently he, he knew what he was talking about. And so I'll, I'll, I'll make a decision now. No, you won't. And I'll even go so far as to say, no, you can't. Now listen to what this Bible says. 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1. Paul's writing in the church of Thessalonica. It's his second letter talking about this subject. Now we beseech you, brethren, again he's talking to Christians, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. That's the rapture. That ye be not soon shaken in mind, or be troubled neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, as the day of Christ is at hand. He says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except there come that falling away first. What are we seeing? Look at the empty seats. A falling away is happening. Come a falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. Ultimately, once you see the falling away, the time clock has begun to tick. And we're going to see these events coming and happening. The falling away first and the man of sin be revealed. That's Antichrist, the son of perdition. Now listen, to, listen to some things about this guy. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that's called God or that is worshipped, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things? Paul says in the second letter, don't you remember what I told you? For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. The spirit of Antichrist has already gone out in the world. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Who's that? That's the person of the Holy Spirit. Only he then... Can you imagine what this world would look like if the influence of God in the person of the Holy Spirit was taken away? And the church taken away? Who restrains evil in this world right now? The church. Christians. And when we're taken out, all hell's going to break loose. He says, this mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And then shall the wicked be revealed. The rapture takes place and then the Antichrist is revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Notice, he's going back and forth on the day of the Lord, which is this event. He's going back and forth. He's up here and then he goes back to the rapture and then he says this Antichrist is going to be revealed but then he fast forwards to the battle of Armageddon when the the armies of the world are arrayed against God and the Lord Jesus Christ and the saints of God and and, and God puts the lights out and they're there on earth in the valley of Megiddo. It's darker than the pitch of night and all of a sudden, from the eastern sky, the, 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 the heavens unfold, and the Lord Jesus Christ, the light of the world, literally destroys the Antichrist in that moment with just the brightness of His coming and the words of His mouth. That's what He's talking about here. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of His mouth, that's the word of God, and shall destroy with the brightness of His coming. That's pretty good. No need for a fight. Just my my Shekinah glory is going to destroy Antichrist. Amen? And and then he's he's destroyed here, but then he goes back and starts talking about him again. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. It, It bothers me to hear this because there's so many churches today preaching these signs. And this this prophet of God is talking about these things. And there's wonders, you know, these guys uh, healing some people. There's a few people down through the line that's been through our church I'd love to have healed. Heal! That's what he says. The working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Who's he manipulating here? Who's who's he uh, convincing that he's God? Them that perish, the lost. Understand, if you're not saved, it's not one day that you're going to perish. It's that you're perishing right now. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. They wouldn't receive it. 
They heard the message of, of Pastor Ross and, and, and they thought, that dude's nuts. I'm a little scared this morning, but that guy's crazy. Have I given you a Bible? Have I given you the words of God from the Bible? Well, absolutely. With all deceitfulness and unrighteousness, that's what Antichrist is doing to them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now here it is, verse 11. What about those people that wouldn't accept Christ? What about those people that maybe someone here this morning, the rapture is going to take place and you're going to be left behind? And you're thinking, well, I know what I, I understand what he's saying. I just don't, I'm not ready to make it. I'll, I'll do it then. No, here's what verse 11 says. For this cause, what, what cause? Because they did not receive the love of the truth and they were not saved. For this cause, God shall send them a strong delusion that they should believe, not the truth, but a lie. To what end? Notice the colon there. To what end? That they might all be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. He says, why am I sending a strong illusion? Because they rejected the gospel. They rejected my son Jesus. And God is literally saying here, I'm damning them to hell because they didn't receive him. That's what it says. Luke 13 verse 23 makes a compelling argument about this. Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that will be saved? And he said unto them, Strive to enter at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and not, shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and hath shut the door. By the way, anytime you see that expression, it, it's attributed to God shutting the door. And ye begin to stand without and to knock, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know not you, not whence you are or who you are. Then shall ye begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and, and thou hast taught in our streets. And he shall say, I tell you, I know ye not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then you shall see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God. But ye yourselves thrust out. And they shall come from the east and from the west and from the north and from the south and shall sit down in the kingdom of God. I don't know how, I don't know why, I don't understand it, but somehow, some way, these people in hell are going to have a a panoramic view of those that are in heaven. It's bad enough the flames of torture in hell and all the memories of the time that they rejected the, the, the gospel of grace, the mercy of God. That'd be bad enough. And, and when 10,000 years has passed, it will have only just begun. I realize it's hard for us to comprehend that, but 10,000 years will, will mean nothing to those in hell. And, and, and here's the thing. 10,000 years in heaven will only just begun. The devil would like to convince someone this morning that all that I've said will never happen. But church, you mark it down, it will. And he will finally come, and when he comes, it will be final. You understand what I'm saying this morning? Oh, how I long for the Lord Jesus to come quickly. I hate the fact that so many people will be left behind and lost. I hate that. That's why I diligently try to share my faith and I preach the Word of God. I give the gospel. Why? I, I don't want anybody to be left behind. But the truth of the matter is, I long to see the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Hill talked about Liz's mom passing this week unexpectedly at a young age. Should have never happened. I hate the fact that it did. I lost my mom back in 2000. She was only 52. After Jesus, I want to see my mother. I long to see her. And all my grandparents and those that have gone on before that knew the Lord Jesus Christ, many of my friends, 
I long for Jesus to come quickly. The very moment the trumpet sounds, the words of that song from old Larry Norman are going to ring true for everyone that rejected and ignored the message and chose to remain lost. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come and you've been left behind. I told you at the outset of the message, I'm not trying to scare anybody. But i got to be honest with you. If I could scare you into being saved, I would do it in a New York minute. You know, the book of Jude says, and some win by fear. Win by fear. This message, I realize, may be a little unsettling to some. But for the child of God, it's a glorious message of hope. This is our blessed hope. That's why he said, you know, the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to meet the Lord in there, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then he said, wherefore comfort one another with these words. It brings me great comfort that I'll see Liz's mom again. It brings me great comfort that I'll, I'll see my mother and my grandmother and, and many that knew the Lord Jesus that I knew, friends and family. I'll see them again, but most of all, I'll see Jesus. And I'm long for it. Why? Because I love Him. And folks, I'm looking around. I'm looking. I'm, I'm trying to discern the times. And as your pastor, I want you to be ready. Amen? I remember the story that Bailey Smith told many years ago. And it was a story of a... Of a he, he's a revivalist in the Southern Baptist Convention. And uh, he, he, he had a message in, uh, about the wheat and the tares, Matthew 13, that was just unbelievably powerful. And he used an illustration because in that particular church they had, you know, we've got stairs here, but the old, uh, a lot of the older churches, they had the flat front and they would have a, the communion table up there. And when they weren't having communion, they would have a, a big, beautiful plant like we have out in the hallway out there. And he talked about how uh, that, that plant there, that, that, those beautiful flowers, and, and, he, and he engaged the crowd to talk about that. And, uh, and he, he asked, what, what, do you think, what do you think about that? What do you think about these beautiful flowers? And they were, some people got some input, and yeah, they're wonderful, they're beautiful. He said, the only problem is those aren't flowers. They're fake. It's just plastic and rubber. It's not the real deal. And then he went on and to use the illustration of, of the flu vaccine, and he said, you know what, when, when, when you get the flu vaccine, what they're actually giving you is a dead version of the flu virus, to keep you from getting the real virus. And he said, I believe with all my heart that, that so many people have gotten a, a fake, dead version of, 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 of Christianity. And it's keeping them from getting the real deal. And they don't even know. They don't even realize this morning that they, they got the shot, but it's not, it's not the real thing. At the close of that service, he gave the invitation. And to his great surprise, the pastor of the church had been there many, many, many years. To great surprise, the pastor's wife came forward. And she took Bailey Smith by the hand and she goes, I'm not going to hell for anybody. She said, I sat back there and struggled back and forth and I've, I've done this over the years. I've struggled and, and, and my thinking was, what in the world are people going to think about a pastor's wife getting saved? Getting assurance of her salvation. She said, I finally come to the realization, you know what, it's not worth it. The heck with people, if they got a problem with the pastor's wife getting saved, I'm getting saved, I don't care what people think. Amen? Amen. And someone here this morning, you might, the thought of you walking an aisle after being a church member for many years or, or maybe haven't made a profession or, or, or maybe you're just a shy person, but the thought of, of walking an aisle and, and letting us take you to a private prayer room and share the gospel and pray that sinner's prayer with you to repent of your sins and to receive the Lord Jesus Christ and the free pardon of sin, that bothers you, that worries you, maybe it gives you, makes you stick at your stomach to think, I don't want to be a, a spectacle, I don't want to be the object of anyone's attention i got a question for you. Are you willing to let that thinking send you to hell? Because if that describes you this morning and Jesus came this afternoon, you would be lost for all eternity. You'd be left behind and you would be lost. You would go through the tribulation period, which is going to be nothing short of horrible. The Bible said, except those days would be short, no one would be saved. No flesh would be saved. Receive the mark of the beast. You can't buy or sell. You can't have food. 
water, place to live, none of that. Unless you take the mark of the beast, you take the mark of the beast, you're doomed to hell no matter what. That's all coming, friend. You reject Christ today and Jesus comes this afternoon, that's what you'll endure. Only to have Jesus come back and destroy the armies of the world and then at the great white throne of judgment pronounce unto them as Jesus said in Matthew 7 in the Sermon on the Mount, uh, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name in thy name done many mighty and wondrous works? Then will I profess unto them, depart from me, ye that work iniquity, I never knew you. And it speaks of being cast into the lake of, cast into hell. People go, well, that's just the grave, you know. Well, what about that whole lake of fire business? What about, what about that? Because the Bible says death and hell was then cast in the lake of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Hey, I don't need any more convincing than that to, go, to, to come to Jesus. Amen? Some we win by fear. Amen. That's what it takes. We'll stand with our heads bowed and eyes closed. Father in heaven, we thank you for the day. And Lord, we thank you for this word. And maybe someone this morning is going, man, alive, he scared the devil out of me today. But the truth is, for the believer in Christ, this is our blessed hope, God. You said this is, you said that a message like this, this is the best news that the child of God can possibly hear. It's our hope, it's what we live for, it's what we long for. So maybe somebody this morning is not uh, doing well, real well right now. They're concerned. God, they don't have to leave here fearful. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. That's what God wants to give them this morning. He'll take that fear away. Well, there's so much, Father, that I don't understand about the end times and the return of the Lord Jesus. I'm certainly no expert in eschatology, the book of Revelation, or the the major prophets in the Old Testament. I'm no expert, and there's a lot I don't know. But but what I do know is, is that you're in control. I love you, and I long for your son Jesus to come and take us home, to be with you. Lord, this morning, my, my prayer is that we would simply see the lost saved, Christians to become ready and I'm not just talking about assurance of their salvation or, 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 or making sure in their own mind yeah I remember I, I, I remember that day I'm talking about Christians that are willing to get serious in a world that's gone mad in a world that's heading to a really bad place and we can assume that we'll never see difficulty or, or rough, uh, a rough patch or tribulation before Jesus comes but we're not promised that we're promised we won't endure the wrath of God but we're not promised that that things are not going to get difficult we're not promised that Christians are not going to be thrown in jail and imprisoned for their faith Lord in heaven what would that look like when it actually cost you something to be a Christian we can barely get people out of the house and off the couch today The truth of the matter is, if they're truly saved, we shouldn't have to get them up and get them out. That's the Holy Spirit of God in them, convicting them, driving them, drawing them, pulling them, wooing them. To come. To be all that we need to be for the Lord Jesus Christ. To be ready. Not that He would come and find us sleeping, but that He would come and find each of us that know Jesus faithfully serving. God in heaven, we love you. We thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and what He did at Calvary for each of us. Lord, we know in and of ourselves we're not worthy of any of your grace and your mercy. But we say thank you. And God, we ask that the power of your Holy Spirit would fill each of us. And that maybe today someone for the first time will get busy and get serious about serving you. That they can be found faithful. The Apostle Paul said, "I, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. I've kept the faith. 
Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give to me, and not to me only, but unto all those people that love His appearing. And God, I have to, I have to think the only ones that are really longing and looking and loving His appearing are those that are busy serving. The guy sitting on the sidelines, he's not looking forward to Jesus to come to find him idle. So God, do the work that only you can do in each of our hearts. Draw us to you. Speak to us of the need of our lives. God, use this church and each of us for your honor and glory. We take nothing for ourselves. We just want to be found faithful and bring glory and honor to you so we can hear you say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. When we get to heaven after the rapture, we're going to have the beam of seed and we'll be rewarded according as our work shall be, you said in the Revelation. Behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to his works. That's what we did as Christians. Bema meaning, you know, there's the bronze, the silver, the gold. Well, I don't know exactly what it'll mean in heaven, but we understand there's going to be different levels of rewards. God, may we strive for the best as we serve Jesus. God, in this invitation, have your will in your way. Some have already come. Some need to come. Some are perhaps praying in the pew. May each of us do business with God today. Not leave in here the same as we came in. We give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. With heads bowed and eyes closed, no one's looking around. This is a private time, and you can come right now and pray at the altar. If you want to come, Brother Copeland's here, uh, and we'll get you with somebody that can take you to a private room and answer your questions and have prayer with you if that's your need this morning. You come on. We're not going to continue the invitation. I know it's after 12. We're not going to keep going for no reason. We're getting ready to cut it off. But if you need to pray, you need to do business with God, I encourage you. Don't wait. Don't put it off. Don't go out into eternity without Jesus. Praise the Lord Jesus. Thank you for your t- kind attention. You can be seated. Roger and Vanessa, come up here and bring that baby girl up here. Ooh. We see where the good Lord kept all of his, his looks. These boys missed it, and here it all is right here. <laughs> well, tell us. Her name, how much her, her, her date of birth, and her particulars. My name's Cadence Jace. Cadence Jace. Yes. Um, she was born January 15th at 6.32 a.m. She weighs 7 pounds, 8 ounces. So. 7 pounds, 8 ounces. Amen. And how long? 19 and 3 quarters. 19 and 3 quarters. Maybe another basketball player in the family. <laughs> Give them a hand. We, we love Roger and Vanessa, and y'all continue to pray for the um, I know Miss Dishman shared with me that getting, getting going again after the delivery has been a little rough physically on her. So let me pray with you guys real quick and pray for this sweet baby. Father in heaven, we come before you. We ask blessings upon this dear family.